welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today is a special edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series. This is one of our Hot Topics recordings, where we aim to provide timely information to help patients, the general public, and healthcare professionals better understand a current popular topic. Today's episode will focus on the current coronavirus outbreak, which is now a worldwide pandemic, and specifically how it impacts allergists and physicians who see patients in the outpatient setting, as well as patients with asthma and allergic conditions. This podcast is being recorded on March 16, 2020. We are currently in the midst of a worldwide pandemic from SARS-CoV-2, also known as COVID-19. The information and impact surrounding this current outbreak is going to evolve over the coming weeks to months. So please stay up to date with current information from vetted resources, such as the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Today's guests were originally scheduled to present a late-breaking session at the annual American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology meeting two days ago, which unfortunately was canceled due to concerns surrounding infection, risk, and travel. They have, however, graciously agreed to join us on the podcast to discuss important information surrounding preparedness. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Daniel Lucy and Dr. George Anisi. Dr. Lucy is a senior scholar with the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. He is an adjunct professor of medicine and infectious diseases at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Since 2001, Dr. Lucy has contributed his expertise towards field responses to pandemics across the world. In 2014, en route to provide hands-on care to patients with Ebola in West Africa, Dr. Lucy proposed a large exhibit on epidemics to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, and it opened in 2018 for three years. Dr. Anisi is an instructor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Paramount School of Medicine and an attending physician in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Dr. Anisi has advanced training in health services research, clinical epidemiology, high-risk pathogen and disaster preparedness, biomedical ethics, and global health. I cannot imagine two better guests for today's conversation. Drs. Lucy and Anisi, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules at this time to join us, and welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's good to be here. All right. So we're going to have a lot to talk about. To best orient ourselves and also our listeners, I will direct each question towards one of you individually, but then we'll allow everybody to chime in as we move along. Uh, So to begin, Dr. Lucy, reports and updates surrounding this coronavirus pandemic have dominated our news cycle for weeks now. Can you please explain where this virus originated from and how it's being spread? Yes, thank you. Um, we think that the virus uh, originated in the uh, China province of Hubei, with the capital of, of Wuhan. Um, it's been said until recently, uh, believed by many, uh, that it started in an animal, a live animal market uh, in Wuhan. Uh, for me, that's always been hard to believe because it rapidly uh, spread from so many people. So uh, I, I don't believe it started in the market in December, um, uh, and I think it started earlier. So uh, I've presented some arguments on the Infectious Disease Society of America, IDSA website in this regard, including yesterday, um, with information I gained from uh, going uh, last month to Shanghai and Hong Kong. Um, but basically, uh, the most important thing is that on Friday, March 13th, um, the South China Morning Post newspaper in Hong Kong presented some uh, data that, uh, that in fact, there were uh, nine patients in the month of November who had no link to the market. So that is more uh, plausible to me. We still don't know the actual origin. Pretty much everyone, including me, thinks it came from an animal, just like SARS and MERS and so many other infections. So it came from some animal. We don't know what animal infected people. It quickly adapted to humans and became transmissible through contact and through the air, probably at least through droplet uh, transmission. And now it's a pandemic, just in a matter of a couple of months. Wow. 
Um, do we know more about is it through sneezing, coughing? Can it be transmitted on surfaces if people touch them that's in, that they're infected with? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's, it, it, our knowledge is accumulating quickly, but basically uh, it, it can be transmitted through the air, probably over short distances, droplet, you know, within 62 meters. Um, there's a lot of concern that maybe rarely it could be uh, aerosol transmitted, uh, so over longer distances, uh, more like uh, tuberculosis or measles. But certainly, uh, as you mentioned, on surfaces, so-called fomites, um, we think that the virus can persist there or either minutes or hours uh, in, a, in a contagious infectious uh, state, and also there's controversy about whether there could be transmission through a fecal oral route. So the virus is found in stool or diarrhea or rectal swabs, but it's not live virus. Um, it's it's, it's, it's a nucleic acid by PCR detection of the virus. Mm. And Dr. Lucy, I've been referring to this as COVID-19, but there are other names that I've, I've seen floated around. Is there another name that we should be using at this time, or do you feel that's the most appropriate way to communicate this? Well, this is the name COVID-19 uh, referring to uh, 2019 when it was first uh, uh, found, uh, uh, coronavirus infection 2019, and that's what the World Health Organization has, has named it. Before that, it was called you know, novel coronavirus, or in China, it's still called novel coronavirus pneumonia, or NCP. That was uh, their name for it, and they're sticking with that name. But I think COVID-19 and its cause, the virus, its cause, it's been named SARS coronavirus 2. So SARS coronavirus 1 was obviously back in 2002 into 2003. Um, and then the other coronavirus is, is the Middle East respiratory syndrome in, in, in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. So I think COVID-19 is the appropriate name for our discussion today. And Dr. Anisi, what types of symptoms are people experiencing from COVID-19? And does it seem to be affecting everybody in the same way? Sure. Well, uh, we're certainly seeing uh, typical symptoms of, of a viral upper respiratory, and in some cases, lower respiratory tract infection. So that includes fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, and myalgias. Um, most people, about 80%, upwards of 80% of people have mild disease, um, and then a smaller group has more severe disease. And uh, we're certainly noting more severe disease in, uh, in the elderly, um, uh, and notably, we're, we're uh, seeing very mild disease in children, uh, and that's a distinct difference from, uh, for example, influenza, um, which affects uh, children uh, uh, in a much stronger way. Does everybody with COVID-19 present with a fever, or are we seeing some people that actually don't have fever at all? Uh, it's a very, very high percentage, but not 100%. Um, uh, but fever, I would say, is the, certainly the most common symptom. Hmm. Dr. Lucy, what lessons have we learned from prior epidemics and pandemics of similar respiratory viruses, as well as the current experiences in China, Iran, and Italy with this current outbreak that can help guide our efforts here in the United States? Yes, I think that it's important at this point in March 16th to um, recognize that there really isn't a good model for this virus and this coronavirus pneumonia pandemic. This is the first ever coronavirus pneumonia uh, pandemic. Um, um, there's been upper respiratory, more like cold uh, 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 viruses, coronaviruses, but this is different. This is pneumonia. Um, so it's not, this is not SARS, it's not MERS, it's not seasonal flu, and I would say it's even not uh, exactly like pandemic influenza. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind in part then to interpret or to put into context the um, change in everyday life that is now occurring um, in, in the United States. Um, so it's important to say this, to understand this is not just a bad flu. It's not. We don't do what we've done last couple of days in America, shutting down restaurants and schools, et cetera, sports events for influenza. So this is different. It's its own virus. It's new. We're learning as we go. As far as Iran, Italy, and China, um, I think it's very important to look at those as examples of what we hope won't happen in America. But personally, I'm very concerned that it will because we're very far behind on where we should be because of the lack of diagnostic tests and, 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 and I think inappropriate the initial guidelines for screening, who to, who to test, et cetera, et cetera. So, so things were very bad in China, in Wuhan, and the entire province of Hubei, uh, and very bad now in Iran, starting in Hong Kong, the whole city, as she was saying, and now in the Tehran, the capital, and Isfahan and elsewhere. And things, as we all know, are very bad in northern Italy and Lombardy, um, um, where the hospital systems are overwhelmed, and many people are, uh, in my opinion, dying who 
um, you know, for the lack of, of basic uh, ICU care. Um, we don't want to be that kind of situation. But I think that if you look at Seattle, we want to, you know, keep an eye on that as, as what might be coming in terms of um, really bad, uh, potentially overwhelming healthcare systems in, in cities and rural areas in, in, in America. I hope that's not the case. And just to briefly mention that um, China, Iran, Italy are, are sort of the worst case scenarios right now uh, with, with Madrid and Spain and France coming on. Uh, unfortunately, quickly uh, afterwards. But we do have, in contrast, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand that have um, uh, responded much better and have so far kept the, uh, and Japan, I should as well, uh, kept the uh, epidemic uh, under um, relatively under control. So uh, I should stop there. It's almost a, it's a podcast in itself to go on. <laughs> Well, it, it sounds to me like this has your, your full respect, and uh, I know the undivided attention of a lot of uh, tremendous healthcare professionals and epidemiologists and public health officials as well. Now, you mentioned testing. Uh, Dr. Anisi, one of the main problems in the United States, at the time of this recording at least, is a lack of available and widespread testing kits. What do these tests actually measure, and what is the current recommendation on who should be tested? Again, with the caveat that this information is likely to change. Sure, absolutely. Um, as Dr. Lucy mentioned, the test is a, a PCR of a viral RNA, and certainly the the testing, both capabilities and the indications, have kind of rapidly evolved um, as as this uh, pandemic has changed. Um, and and I agree that that we're behind from that standpoint. Uh, testing was initially res- restricted to the CDC. Um, uh, that uh, I think was uh, was unfortunate. It's now available. Um, uh, through the CDC, through state um, Department of Health labs, now through private companies, and now as in-house testing at many hospitals who have either developed their own assays or um, uh, adapted and quality controlled um, commercial assays. And um, the indications have likewise evolved significantly, uh, started with um, based on a clinical syndrome plus either direct contact with a known uh, infected patient or from high-risk travel areas. But that's significantly expanded as kind of the epidemiology has changed. Um, and now the kind of current recommendations give significant leeway to clinician judgment and interpretation of ongoing changes in local epidemiology. Uh, so th- that's uh, changed drastically as well. And I would say Currently, we're um, we're certainly seeing evidence of what I would call domestic community spread. Um, that is to say, patients becoming infected without a known clear um, sick contact, just transmission in the community. And once that happens, uh, travel history becomes far less relevant, uh, mm-hmm. and it should be based on a clinical syndrome, um, and testing should be much more widespread. And we're trying to get there, but we're not there yet. Mm. And, and for those listening who aren't familiar, what type of test is this? Is this a blood sample? Is it a, a, a nasal swab? How do we actually get the samples? Yeah, absolutely. The, the preferred method is either a nasopharyngeal swab or an oropharyngeal swab. Uh, it can also be detected off of lower respiratory tract samples like sputum uh, or from a bronchoscopy. Actually, the nasopharyngeal swab and oropharyngeal swab are the preferred methods. They're the easiest to run uh, logistically from the lab, so they're just uh, absolutely sufficient. And it's the exact same process that you'd use to get a a normal respiratory viral panel, for example, to screen for flu or um, rhinovirus or adenovirus. So it's not an invasive testing um, uh, to get this done. The bigger problem was um, getting the uh, the appropriate reagents and quality controlling the the checks, um, and then kind of the logistics and and dare I say politics of of getting testing uh, in uh, specific institutions rather than just centrally. Okay, and um, is it safe to say that this test is best used to detect somebody who has active infection or is shedding the virus, but not to assess somebody who was previously infected and has recovered? That's an interesting question. I would say we're still learning about what to do on the back end of illness um, in terms of uh, documenting clearance and um, uh, when someone is safe to to kind of remove themselves from isolation or quarantine. So I would say that is still something that we're really learning about. Um, uh, right now, we're we're certainly focused on diagnosis in order to um, uh, kind of mitigate further spread. And, um, uh, and I would say that... Um, Many of us, or most of us, would like to be able to test more, um, more broadly, um, including potentially even in minimally symptomatic uh, individuals, where it might impact um, uh, community spread. Mm, interesting. And so, along those lines, Dr. Lucy, 
As testing becomes more widely available, do you anticipate that we're going to see this huge spike in the number of COVID-19 cases in the United States? And if so, what does that actually mean? Well, I do think we'll see a, a large increase, whether it's huge or not. You know, it depends on what numbers we assign to that, but it's going to be large. Uh, I think uh, once we have more uh, widespread testing, in, 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 in part because there's always been many more patients, I'm afraid, uh, in, in this country than we realized uh, for the reasons that Dr. Nizi said and that we can hear about in the media. Uh, um, uh, but now it's continued to spread and spread and spread every day in many more places in the United States. And if we finally get to where our government has said we're going to get to uh, for some time, but again, most recently in the past few days, in other words, uh, drive up or drive through testing, which uh, uh, has been done a lot in South Korea, where they test up to 10,000 people in one day. Hmm. Uh, to my knowledge, as of last Friday, the United States had not even tested 10,000 people total. So the answer is yes. I, you know, I think there will be a huge spike in the number of cases in terms of lab confirmed cases, which is very important, I think, to emphasize for this disease. It's lab-confirmed cases. For many other epidemics, um, at some point you go to just probable or clinically diagnosed cases. Um, so yes, we're going to see a large number. And what does it mean? It means we're in very big trouble, very big mm -hmm. trouble, and that we might become Wuhan, we might become Tehran, we might become um, Bergamo or Russia or northern northern northern. Uh, Italian cities, uh, healthcare systems overwhelmed, uh, and, and again, I would look at not only those places in the past or the present, but uh, look at, at Seattle and elsewhere in the United States where we know that the most cases are right now, including you know, New Rochelle and New York City and you know, places in Florida, et cetera. So um, I think we could be in very big trouble in terms of potentially having the healthcare system overwhelmed. Mm. Well, to build on that, um, that sobering perspective. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when epidemiologists talk about this concept of flattening the curve of cases? Why is that important? And as a follow-up, wouldn't it be better just to have everyone get sick and get it over with? Uh, Dr. Anisi said, you know, 80% of people have mild illness. So walk us through what that really means. Right. So I, I, I agree with Dr. Anisi, first of all, but to explain what, what that means, uh, first of all, flattening the coronavirus curve, or what I prefer the term is flattening the coronavirus peak, is really what the issue is, is uh, avoiding having our healthcare system overwhelmed, exceeding the healthcare system capacity. And, and that's in any given place. It's not going to be, you know, in every place in America, since we're such a big country, so many cities and rural areas, et cetera. Um, but if you have so many patients at the same time within any given period of time, within weeks, within a month, whatever, that, that your healthcare system can't um, uh, provide a good standard of care, then what happens is, again, there's not enough ventilators, there's not enough ICUs, there's not enough you know, healthcare workers or personal protective equipment. So what happens is patients suffer even more and patients die who otherwise wouldn't have died. So what you want to do is you know, flatten the curve, the epidemiological curve, and the curve just means if you drive on the x-axis, it's a number of cases of patients with this infection. That's the y-axis, right? the number of cases, and the x-axis is time. So if you don't do anything to uh, spread out the infections to slow down the infections over time, then you have a very high curve, very high peak. Many, many patients, you overwhelm the system, people die, healthcare workers are put at more risk and get infected than otherwise would be the case if you institute mitigation efforts like social distancing, you know, shutting down um, you know, uh, places and opportunities, if you will, particularly outside of the home and the public where people can uh, transmit the virus to other people and get the virus transmitted to them. So that's what mitigation or social distancing, um, and that's the thought be behind closing down restaurants and bars and schools and uh, that kind of thing. So then you still get infections, but it's, they're spread out over a longer period of time. And so the peak of the coronavirus curve doesn't uh, lead to so many patients that they overwhelm or that the healthcare system is overwhelmed. So fewer patients die your healthcare providers get um, overwhelmed also and get, get, get sick or get infected. Um, so, so that's, that's the thinking. So um, as Dr. Nisi said, 80% we think have mild infection, but some of those develop pneumonia. They just don't need to be in ICUs or ventilated. Um, so you don't, you actually don't want to have everybody just get infected uh, and get it over with, so to speak, because the, the price in terms of 
suffering and death and economic uh, damage and the healthcare system being overwhelmed and healthcare workers being overwhelmed and infected um, is too great a price. And just lastly, I want to say numerically, it's important facts that in uh, in China, more than 3,300, 3,300 healthcare workers got infected with this virus, at least 2,055 of whom were laboratory confirmed as of February 20th. So that's a WHO report that uh, is on the WHO website uh, at the end of February. In Italy, there's more than 1,100 healthcare workers as of a week ago who have gotten infected. In Iran, I don't know any numbers, but I know through anecdotes and talking to friends that, that there are quite a few people, healthcare workers, infected there, and a smaller number in South Korea and in, in Japan and elsewhere. Mm. And, you know, something I like to talk about as well is just because COVID-19 is out there, that's not the only reason why people would seek emergency care. We still have motor vehicle accidents and, and adults with heart attacks, and, and people need to have these services, and it could absolutely cripple the system, as you described. Uh, Dr. Anisi, um, can you build upon something that Dr. Lucy mentioned in regards to some of the public health measures? What are some of the individual and population-based precautions being used at this time to help slow the spread of COVID-19 in the United States and elsewhere? Sure. The uh, Certainly initially, we really focused on kind of a containment approach, which was uh, international travel restrictions and returning traveler screening and quarantine um, and as Dr. Lucy mentioned, we're, we really pivoted, and uh, appropriately so, from a strategy of containment to a strategy of mitigation. Um, uh, um, so that, that includes the things like social distancing, um, uh, very good hand hygiene, just trying to reduce your contacts um, uh, as kind of primary sources of, of that kind of flattening of the curve. And then uh, targeted um, efforts to protect the most vulnerable, um, for example, patients with immunosuppression, patients who are older, um, uh, and reducing the risk of uh, in-hospital spread, both to other patients and to healthcare workers. And so um, that involves as much diagnostic information as we can. So diagnosing the patients is vitally important to then identifying how to, how to handle them, appropriate personal protective equipment, of which there have been off and on shortages um, for various uh, reasons, um, and, and an appropriate isolation. And so kind of you put all those things together, and, and that's um, – that's where we started, and that's kind of where we've shifted to now. Now, I live in Ohio, and it's, this has rapidly evolved. In the last few days alone, they've closed all public schools for at least three weeks, and then just yesterday, the governor shut down all bars and restaurants. Um, do you anticipate that we're going to see that expanding to other states as well? Yes, I think so, and I, and I think it's appropriate at this point. Um, uh, really, that, that, that concept of social distancing is is fundamental to – um, to that flattening of, of the curve or flattening of the peak, um, where you really just need to reduce your um, your contacts with other in individuals. And um, uh, and I, I, I uh, heard it said somewhere on the Internet, and I, I, I can't uh, recall the exact attribution, but if it feels weird that you're walking around and not interacting with other people and not shaking hands and feeling kind of alone, that actually means that you're doing it appropriately. That's what mm -hmm. social distancing should feel like. Well, that, that's an uh, interesting perspective. And, you know, in regards to the, the times that we live in, it's 2020, we all have electronic devices, social media, FaceTime, so we have ways where we can stay connected with other humans, which is going to be extremely important from an emotional standpoint as we take these extreme precautions. Uh, Dr. Lucy, can we accurately estimate that COVID-19 will decrease over the summer months? We've heard a lot of officials and people saying this on the on the news even. Um, you know, other respiratory viruses tend to fizzle out in the summer. Do we anticipate that's going to happen here? Well, we don't know for sure, again, because this is a brand new virus. Um, but we do know that, that there's no one in the world who has immunity. Uh, as best we know, perhaps children have some kind of cross immunity from other you know, coronavirus infections, but we don't know that. It's just a hypothesis. Um, and so I'd say the answer is we don't know. Uh, I think that what we should do, though, um, operationally, if you will, uh, is assume it's going to, transmission is going to continue through the summer, our summer in the northern hemisphere, this June, July, August, um, and, and hope that it does decrease. Um, um, uh, but even during pandemic flu H1N1 in 2009, there was transmission through the summer, although it went down, but then it came back up, um, you know, in, in the autumn, uh, September, October, November. So I think that we should prepare for two things. One is the transmission will uh, continue, 
perhaps decreased, hopefully decreased uh, in our summer, uh, but also that there might be a large increase in the in when weather gets colder in the in the autumn. Um, but I think it's very important to emphasize that you know that we live in the northern hemisphere, but there's the southern hemisphere, and unfortunately, uh, the virus has already um, uh, been found in multiple countries in the southern hemisphere. First in Australia, then in South Africa, and um, and then and then um, multiple countries in South America: Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Peru. And so, when it's our summer this July, it's their winter, um, and so the real high risk is to have year-round transmission during the winter in the southern hemisphere and then in the northern hemisphere, just like influenza does, and then to have transmission, you know, from north to south and south to north, so you get year-round transmission of this coronavirus. And it may, if that occurs, I think it's going to become a, a new part of the you know, human condition, if you will. It's a, there'll be influenza year-round, and there'll be this coronavirus pneumonia year-round. Mm. You've both given us a fantastic perspective on the the global sort of picture and precautions and and why we need to take all these steps now. But let's transition a bit to some issues more specific to you know our listeners and allergists and physicians and patients with allergic conditions. And Dr. Nisi, you, you've talked about how COVID-19 can you know cause illness and the typical symptoms. But what about somebody who has asthma? We know asthma affects millions of children and adults throughout the world, and we also know that viral infections are a common cause of exacerbations. What do we know about COVID-19 and can do it the same? Can it do the same thing? Uh, well, certainly any chronic lung disease um, and any form of immunosuppression, I think both make uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2 and the, the disease of COVID-19 kind of higher risk for that individual. Um, and so uh, someone who has asthma um, has a chronic lung disease and, and, you know, a subset of patients with asthma have higher levels of chronic immunosuppression um, uh, that would put them at risk for um, for greater disease. Uh, fortunately, we don't think that um, inhaled corticosteroids, kind of the mainstay of, of therapy, um, increases your risk. We're talking much more specifically about systemic uh, corticosteroids um, as, as kind of the, the risk measure in a couple different ways. Um, and so, you know, we, we certainly presume that SARS-CoV-2 will increase the risk of asthma exacerbations or lead to asthma exacerbations. That's certainly what um, you know, many, many or most or all respiratory viral infections do to varying degrees. I would say we're not definitively able to answer it yet just because we're still kind of early in this and, and learning what it does. Um, but uh, um, but the presumption will be that it does. The one silver lining is that competing with that is that we're seeing, um, you know, better outcomes and, and less severe disease in younger children. Um, uh, and so that may help mitigate some of that risk. Along those lines, at this point in time, what recommendations should we make to patients with asthma to help maintain their health and prevent exacerbations? And then also, what should they do if they start to have symptoms? Well, to be honest, I don't think that they should be doing anything different than we're recommending for anyone else, except that they should really be doing those things. Uh, that mm -hmm. is to say, you know, social distancing and, and um, avoiding sick contacts and uh, washing their hands and things like that, uh, avoiding travel. Um, uh, so it's that I would say the advice is no different, um, but it's just of utmost importance that they do because they're at higher risk potentially for for worse outcomes. Um, and um, and then I would say you know for anyone you know, I would say for the majority of people who get symptomatic with COVID-19, they can do just fine at home. Um, and and in fact that's actually the preferable location reduces risk to others. Um, and uh, and so. Um, that would also be what we'd hope for a, a patient with asthma, but any patient who has a higher risk, it's worth thinking ahead to kind of what their plan would be if they're at home and, and starting to get symptoms that become more severe. So, you know, who they're going to call, what their kind of first steps are. Um, and so sometimes it, it's, it's recommended for those patients to have earlier contact with their, uh, with their clinicians, whether it's a primary care doctor, allergist, pulmonologist, um, uh, or even the local health department, so that there's kind of a already a connection in place, and that if they were to get worse, they could get the help they needed faster. 
Yeah, that's important information. And if I may, I'd like to add on that this is the perfect time now uh, to plan ahead. Make sure that, you know, for anybody with asthma, their treatment plan is up to date. You know exactly when to start treatment and what to do. And also refill your prescriptions. We don't want you to run out of, of critical medications such as albuterol or other treatments, um, you know, for whatever reason. So this is the time to prepare and plan. Contact your physician. Talk about your plan should symptoms occur. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. Uh, and now, uh, we also, you know, as allergists and immunologists, we treat patients with a wide variety of immune deficiencies. And, of course, that can be severe immune deficiencies or more subtle ones. Uh, but do you have any recommendations for what those patients should do? Should they do anything differently other than social distancing and what the general public is doing? You know, again, I think I'm, I'm going to stick with the party line, which is really that it's the same advice. It's just, you know, more important for those those subgroup of patients that are at higher risk, Um uh, but uh, um, but I don't think that they that there's special instructions. It's just an emphasis on on how important those things are. Yeah. Now, now, Dr. Lucy, allergists are it's mainly an outpatient specialty, and there's a lot of physicians in in this country and throughout the world that see patients mostly as outpatients. What should we tell our patients if they call us due to acute illness, such as fever and cough? Should they stay home? Should they come in for testing? Should they go to the emergency department? Um, what, what's the best advice we can give? So honestly, this is a, a beyond my uh, ability to answer in, in general terms because I think it depends uh, on on the patient. How well do you know the patient? Also, where is uh, the, the the city or the rural area or the suburban area in terms of the epidemic, um, known epidemic? And so it gets to the uh, the concept of uh, sort of a prior probability of someone having this uh, COVID nineteen as opposed to you know all of the many other. Uh, reasons that, physici- that physicians would be called by by their patients. So I would say it's most important to um, follow the day by day updated uh, guidance from your uh, local or jurisdictional health department and the uh, hospitals that you might be associated with and with what's going on with uh, you know, in other uh, outpatient clinics you know in your uh, in your neighborhood or in your city. And that's the best advice. It's going to be changing if not every day, every couple of days. Mm. And what about a patient who comes in for a scheduled, vil- uh, scheduled visit um, and they have no knowledge of exposure to COVID-19, but upon check-in, you find that they have a fever? What happens in that situation? Uh, I guess I would say, again, you know, fever is many, many, many causes. And uh, uh, right now, today, the most common cause is going to be COVID-19. Uh, uh, but also, I think it's important to be uh, aware of what Dr. Nisi had said earlier, that um, that. The um, community spread, uh, once it starts, then um, you won't have uh, an epidemiological link or any kind of contact tracing to, to help you know whether somebody's infected with this new virus or not. So it's a very uh, difficult uh, situation to discern what the right thing is to do. Um, but I think, again, you have to uh, consider each patient individually and, 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 and how do what do you know them? What Do they have some other known reason for fever? You know, do they have influenza, which is still going on in this country, obviously? And um, and then look for the specific guidance uh, from, from health departments or from hospitals, but then apply that as all good physicians do to your individual patient. Mm, a, a rapidly evolving situation indeed. Dr. Anisi, you mentioned this this concern about systemic corticosteroids in the setting of acute COVID-19 infection. Can you describe what we know about why that may be harmful? Uh, Sure, absolutely. So we're really still in the early stages of learning about SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus uh, that's causing the the current uh, pandemic, but um, we have... um, our experience from 2002, 3, 4 in with SARS, SARS-CoV-1, uh, and that's where we're extrapolating a good amount of this from. And and in that outbreak, uh, we saw that systemic corticosteroids, not inhaled, but systemic corticosteroids, uh, did bad things. They delayed viral clearance. Uh, they may have accounted for increased mortality. Um, and uh, and so we've extrapolated that to the kind of the current outbreak of a virus that we're still learning about. I'll note that. Um, that that poor outcomes association with uh, systemic corticosteroids also exists in influenza, in particular noticed first, I would say, most robustly in 2009 H1N1 influenza A, uh, which continues to circulate as kind of a seasonal influenza now, and uh, we continue to see poor outcomes 
with systemic corticosteroids, particularly for severe disease, so patients that need to come in to the hospital or to the ICU or need mechanical ventilation. And so um, uh, I think there's pretty good consensus recommendations right now that um, systemic corticosteroids uh, probably shouldn't be given to kind of all comers uh, with COVID-19. Um, I'll say I've seen one or two more recent data points that might question that, so I think we're still open to to learning uh, more about this and, and certainly revising that if, if the data changes our, our understanding of it, but I think that would be the current, the current recommendation. And um, importantly, the, what we're talking about is, uh, is treatment for COVID-19, not for treatment for other things that may be going on at the same time, which would change your, your kind of risk-benefit calculation for steroids. Uh, it's, along those lines, you, I've heard you say a couple of times, and I'm so glad you did, that inhaled corticosteroids do not seem to pose increased risk in patients uh, with asthma or COVID-19. So we want to make sure that we proactively emphasize to all of our patients that they should keep taking their controller medications to try to prevent an exacerbation. But that being said, uh, as you know, systemic corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment when somebody has an asthma flare-up. Um, so what do we do if somebody with asthma comes in with suspected or proven COVID-19 and they're having an exacerbation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you treat what you think is causing um, uh, what you think is causing the patient's problems, and and if there's a separate uh, evidence-based reason uh, for systemic corticosteroids in a patient, I think it, it you probably want to give them. Um, certainly, it's a case by case, individual patient kind of risk assessment about uh, what you think are the dominant drivers and and how risky is your intervention. But uh, I certainly think for someone where we think an asthma exacerbation is as a large driver, whether it's triggered by COVID-19 or not, but when it's a large driver for the reason that they're in the hospital or in the ICU, um, I think corticosteroids are, would, are, you know, uh, should be of, uh, you know, under great consideration for them. And certainly on the more severe end of the spectrum, I think it makes perfect clinical sense to, to do that. Um, it's just that you need that separate indication. We, we, I think right now, the best interpretation of the data is that we shouldn't be giving steroids for COVID-19 itself. Ah, okay. Thank you for clarifying. I know it's a point of confusion among a lot of professionals and patients as well. Now, Dr. Lucy, let's go back to the outpatient office setting because I think this is going to rapidly evolve and, and cause a lot of concern for thousands of medical professionals and providers in our country. What steps should outpatient physician offices take after seeing a patient with fever and cough? Do they have to do any reporting or special cleaning? Really, the issue, I think, is does the patient have COVID-19? But then the issue from that is we don't know because you can you get a test and you, there's no point of care rapid, you know, rapid diagnostic test. There's no you know, antigen test. You're not going to get the answer. So it's very, very difficult, I think, particularly when you know that there's community spread um, of the virus. So, again, I... I I hate to say it, but I have to say I don't know because I don't think it is known uh, other than, you know, day by day, week by week uh, guidance from health departments, from hospitals, uh, as far as what ideally to do. So it comes down to a lot. The first branch point in the algorithm, if you will, is, is you, do you think the patient has COVID-19 or not? Uh, and if you think they do, then how do you find out? How can you get a test? It's still, as of this day, difficult to get a test in the United States of America. Um, and to get the result back in a timely manner. Uh, we've been told that's going to change, you know, very soon. It was going to change last week, and, um, and, 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 and I'm sure it will, uh, you know, by April, but hopefully before that. So um, so those are really the issues, and uh, there, there really is no um, uh, one answer that I can give that would, that would answer the, you know, the, the questions that you've asked, David. No, and I think I think your answers are actually spot on because hopefully our listeners will take away that you know we have world's experts on this topic who don't have answers right now. So it's it's imperative that everybody stays on top of the latest information and guidance from our public health officials in regards to testing and precautions and things along those lines. So I think that um, that that is a very important message to deliver. Um, now, Dr. Lucy, help, also help us understand, what's the current recommended personal protective equipment that medical professionals should wear prior to interacting with somebody who has COVID-19? Uh, and along those lines, what if they aren't sure if they have the infection? Right. So this uh, uh, virus, the sars cov virus 2 causing COVID-19, uh, we believe is spread through uh, respiratory spread through um, droplets. So... Um, 
and also on phone lines through direct contact. You know, so that's why, as Dr. Nisi said, we don't we're not supposed to be shaking hands. So basically, you want to use standard and, and droplet precautions. So using a mask, uh, and gloves, uh, and eye protection is, is also important. Um, there's situations in which there might be an aerosol generated, aerosol generated procedures, uh, in which case then you need an N95 respirator rather than a surgical mask. But a very big problem that's also already occurring in America, and I'm afraid it's going to become very much worse, um, and, and I'm not sure when it will get better, is that there's a shortage of these N95 respirators already in some places, not everywhere, but some places. And very unfortunately, um, the U.S. strategic national stockpile um, of N95 respirators was not replenished after the 2009-10 pandemic of influenza when we had about 83 million and 95s at the beginning in 2009 of that pandemic of influenza, but now, beginning of this one, we only have 12 million N95s. It's a terrible oversight, uh, and it's the healthcare workers that um, are going to be put at risk and get infected as a result. So, uh, so that's the situation. Um, there's no clear or e easy answers. But I'd say for people that are uh, obtaining the nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal swab. There's been some mention that it's okay just to use a surgical mask now because there's a shortage of N95s. For me, as a physician, that um, I, I have a real problem with that recommendation. That's an official recommendation, but um, boy, it, you know, if you put, if you put people at risk who are obtaining the specimens, and remember, they're obtaining the specimens from people who are likely to have the infection, right? Um, and sometimes people cough or sneeze when, when you put the, the swab in the nose. So uh, I think the, the, the people obtaining the specimens should have uh, at least an, uh, an N95 respirator and, and eye protection, or if they don't have an N95, then a face shield uh, and a surgical mask. Uh, but we have to protect our healthcare workers because if we're gone, if we're sick, who's going to take care of us? And then who's going to take care of our patients? Mm. Oh, uh, you you mentioned coughing and sneezing, which is a perfect segue for Dr. Nisi. You know, we're, right now it's the middle of March, and we're approaching peak spring tree pollen season, which you know causes millions of people to have these similar symptoms that COVID nineteen can present with. Uh, are there any basic ways that we can help people differentiate between the two? Is fever the best indicator, or, or other signs that we can point towards? That's a good question, and I'll bring up that it's not just that we're entering tree pollen season, but we're also still at the tail end of a pretty bad uh, respiratory viral season from non-novel uh, viruses, uh, regular coronavirus, rhinovirus, enterovirus, um, and those present even more similar, I would say, uh, uh, to COVID-19 than, than um, allergies. So we've kind of certainly already had to navigate this a little bit. Uh, I think with respect to um, uh, kind of seasonal allergies, fever, fatigue, myalgias, those, those would be probably the biggest differences, but uh, there are certainly significant uh, kind of clinical syndrome overlap, uh, and that's a, that's a big problem. Uh, and I think it, it just gets back to the idea that greater testing capabilities and a lower threshold to test is, is really would be key um, to making a, a difference here. And certainly, you know, speaking as someone who's taking care of these patients or trying to find these patients, uh, uh, and, you know, in, in our health system and, and uh, um, who are presenting to our health system, uh, we want to be able to test as many people as we can. We, we currently can't do that, uh, just like hospitals across the country. Mm. And along those lines of testing, Dr. Lucy, do you have any thoughts on what would we do if, say, somebody was in the office on a Monday uh, and they were tested at whatever period of time and it comes back that they're positive, say, within 14 days? Does that office then need to do anything differently in regards to reporting or, or contacting other patients or staff? So, again, I think it's to depend on the, you know, the official guidelines of the local jurisdiction and or the state jurisdiction um, uh, but but the issue from the medical point of view, is, as I see it, is that if you had someone who had the infection, they were in the office, um, if they were, uh, particularly if they were symptomatic, coughing, sneezing, uh, 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 which maybe that's why they came to your office in the first place. Um, but even if they weren't symptomatic, although then why would they be in your office? Or, or, mm. um, uh, uh, they still could be potentially contagious. So in other words, they could be shedding the virus, which means that the virus could be on you know, tabletops or floors or, 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 or so-called fulmites in in that office. Uh, and then potentially other patients could have been exposed, as well as the people, the staff, and the healthcare workers in, in that office. So that's a really a, a clear and present danger. Um, so, uh, you know, it might be prudent to, uh, you know, have, uh, I'm not recommending 
this myself, but it certainly seems prudent. Uh, and maybe, and I hope there are such recommendations by the appropriate jurisdictional authorities that basically to um, undertake enhanced cleaning of, of offices, if you will, uh, not just at the end of the day, but maybe uh, you know at the beginning and sometime during the day, et cetera, as well as at the end of the day. Um, because also, if it, there may be patients that have the infection that don't come back positive because they don't get tested because they couldn't get tested or um, they don't get tested until, you know, sometime later or you don't hear about them until, like you said, up to 14 days later. In the meantime, they might have shed the virus in the office and if it wasn't, you know, basically clean or you know, neutralized, killed, then other people would have been put at risk. So I think, you know, again, it's just my opinion, but it seems it would be very prudent to enhance uh, the routine cleaning um, procedures and, the, and increase the frequency of them in in, uh, in healthcare providers' offices. Hmm. And, and you both describe this very challenging scenario where we believe that there, there's community widespread uh, infection and illness of COVID-19, but yet we lack the ability to test. Uh, many patients have mild illness or they're asymptomatic. And from you know a standpoint of of allergy and immunology, which is mainly an outpatient based specialty, a lot of our visits really are not essential. Uh, patients who have chronic conditions that are either well controlled, or uh, you know say they're receiving allergy shots in the office. So, Dr. Lucy, I'll ask you the difficult question: um, Do you think we're going to reach a point where we simply shut down all non-essential outpatient healthcare visits to help prevent the spread of this? Honestly, I I I, I hope not. Um, but uh, and I haven't heard anyone say that so far. But honestly, um, I, I did hear people in America, uh, senior health officials, uh, who I won't name, but uh, others heard them as well. You know, maybe six weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago saying that we would never take the measures in America that were taken in, in, in Wuhan or more recently in Italy, but now we've taken them. You know, in, in New York City, not just Ohio, you shut down bars, restaurants, schools are closed everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So would that apply to outpatient um, clinics? I haven't heard anyone say that, but I think it's everything in medicine comes down to risk and benefit. And that's, yeah. again, like with this epidemic, everything's in flux. And I'd like to add at this point um, that the American Academy of Allergy and Immunology is working on providing information such as contingency plans for its members and allergists and really any physician in the outpatient world uh, to really start thinking ahead and thinking through what this would look like in the office setting in regards to shutting down non-essential visits, moving towards more of a telehealth model, uh, what to do with patients who are receiving immunotherapy and things along those lines. So um, that information will hopefully be coming uh, just you know in a matter of days. Uh, for all of our listeners. Now, Dr. Anisi, do we have any knowledge whether somebody with COVID-19 can develop lasting immunity or if they can even get sick again from this illness? I would say we don't know yet. Uh, it's, uh, we're still early in this, and, and I think we don't yet have great information uh, or certainly enough information about viral stability or instability to say um, uh, we certainly, you know, there's some new interesting theories coming out, for example, for why children have milder disease um, that, uh, you know, if they're exposed to frequent kind of regular circulating coronavirus infections, um, they, that may provide them some cross immunity and that might suggest that um, there's, uh, there'll be some lasting immunity or at least partial immunity. But I would say we're still very early in this and, and understanding um, whether you're going to have lasting immunity, whether this uh, the, this novel coronavirus will kind of continue to kind of circulate in more of a seasonal way, the way uh, 2009 H1N1 influenza A has now become a kind of a seasonal influenza. Um, it's very difficult to say, I think, this early. And Dr. Nisi, along those lines, uh, I've heard you know other stories and reports. Uh, you know, if somebody does contract COVID-19 twice in a short period of time, are they at risk to develop a severe immune response such as cytokine storm? Well, I, again, I, I don't think we can say anything about what might happen with a with a kind of a recurrent infection because we don't know yet if that's kind of even possible. But I'll certainly say that uh, the, the initial infection of COVID-19, certainly the more severe cases, certainly mimics um, a cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome. Uh, and China's actually um, approved emergency use. Their regulatory uh, bodies approved emergency use of tocilizumab, so an anti-IL-6 drug. Um, that we've approved in the United States for 
uh, cytokine release syndrome related to CAR T cell therapy. And, and so they certainly believe that um, this looks like uh, cytokine release syndrome. I, I would say we don't yet have kind of efficacy data to guide that. Um, and I think there are some other clinical trials of, of novel IL-6 related um, uh, um, uh, agents that are coming down the pike, um, but I think it's, it's very early. But certainly clinically looks like a, a kind of a heightened cytokine state. That said, a lot of reasons that you end up in the ICU do that as well. And wa- walk us through what would that look like, uh, you know, as opposed to just somebody who has, say, run-of-the-mill or mild COVID-19. If they undergo the cytokine release state, how do they present and how does that differ? Um, I would say mostly just um, uh, kind of more severity overall. Uh, I'd, I'd look for more uh, hemodynamic instability. I would look for more um, uh, evidence of end organ dysfunction. Um, uh, actually, patients coming in t- even to the ICU with um, with COVID-19, all, kind of all comers coming into the ICU have pretty mild laboratory derangements, I would say, uh, relative to the, the kind of the clinical picture of their disease. But certainly in these patients, um, I would expect uh, uh, more severe derangements, uh, more severe um, uh, lymphopenias, um, uh, certainly elevated inflammatory markers uh, by definition, um, uh, and potentially a a, um, a longer arc of critical illness. Um, uh, uh, we're already seeing very interesting kind of preliminary reports, especially from Italy, about difficulty in, in weaning patients from a ventilator when the, the weaning is tried kind of earlier in their course. Um, and potentially even with some setbacks from that, and and that may represent that phenotype. Although again, kind of too early to tell. Hmm. Wow, uh, Dr. Lucy, vaccine. We we know that vaccine development takes years due to the need for rigorous testing, surrounding safety and efficacy. Um, but in the meantime, are there any other approaches being investigated for specific treatment against COVID-19? Dr. Anisi mentioned this anti-IL-6 therapy as 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 a potential um, treatment. But what else are you hearing about? Well, I put it into two categories. One is a specific uh, antiviral uh, uh, experimental uh, drugs, and then there's the more of a immunological uh, therapies, uh, like what Dr. Nisi mentioned, uh, um, uh, although that was not specific against the virus per se, but the cytokine storm that the virus might induce. So, so there's a long list that I won't go through of potential candidates for treatment. Uh, one of the most promising, uh, uh, according to the World Health Organization, is this uh, intravenous-only drug. It's not an oral form. We're called remdesivir. That was uh, used in the trial uh, to treat Ebola patients in Eastern Congo. Unfortunately, that didn't work. It's been used to uh, um, t- uh, treat uh, Nipah virus in, in uh, non-human primates. Um, it's been used in the test tube to, to show that it inhibits uh, coronaviruses like this one and like the MERS coronavirus. Um, so it's the one that seems to be the leading candidate, and it's been uh, uh, the first patient in the United States received it. It was published in the Indian Journal, uh, but also uh, hundreds of patients have been enrolled in randomized controlled trials in Wuhan and probably in other uh, cities that have many fewer patients um, um, uh, uh, with this disease in China. I am somewhat confident that the results will be known in next month, by, in April sometime. I'm not at all knowledgeable or confident about uh, what the results will be because they're blinded, randomized, controlled trials. About three hours ago this morning, I was on the phone with uh, some uh, Chinese physicians uh, who didn't care of patients, um, and organized through this uh, China Global TV Networks uh, uh, to try to bring together doctors from around the world, from China. There's another doctor from uh, from Kenya on the line, uh, myself. Um, and uh, the, China, the doctor from China um, mentioned, um, again, I'm not advocating this at all, but she said that, yes, they've used the, um, the monoclonal antibody against the interleukin-6 receptor that's uh, FDA approved here, as Dr. Nisi said, for various indications, including cytokine kind of release syndrome. Uh, but what she said that I really hadn't heard about before uh, is Dr. Lee uh, uh, on the phone call this morning from China that she's an intensivist. She said that they've been seeing pulmonary fibrosis develop in people who are not able to get off the ventilator, like Dr. Nisi is saying, some patients can't mm. can get off. And so they're using a, uh, an inhibitor. She started a trial. She said it's just been submitted for publication uh, 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 of, of an inhibitor of uh, TGF beta to try and inhibit um, fibrosis. Um, so th- there's th- those kind of uh, approaches. And then the last thing I'll say is that there's also the use of plasma from people who survived. So the idea is, you know, immune survivor plasma that has antibody against this virus. I'm sure also that in the United States and China, and I'm sure many other places in the world, well, 
some other places in the world. There's efforts to develop monoclonal antibodies against the virus itself by taking the B cells from people who are survivors and determining which B cell population is actually making the specific antibody, hopefully neutralizing the antibody against this virus, and then from those B cells who develop monoclonal antibodies. And the proof of concept for that was also last August in the Congo treating Ebola. Um, there was a, 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 a monoclonal antibody that was developed from the blood of a patient in 1995 at Ebola, developed here at the NIAID, NIH, uh, and it was shown to be quite effective in the treatment of Ebola. Not perfectly, mostly with early stage disease, but something is better than nothing. So it's proof of concept. So I think that same thing, same approach, same strategies being used now for this uh, COVID-19 SARS coronavirus to monoclonal antibodies by isolating E cells of survivors. Well, you know, after the sort of the somber tone and discussion we had over the last hour or so, I think that, you know, it's nice to hear that there's a lot of different researchers and physicians and scientists looking at many different options that may uh, be useful in the future. So there's some light at the end of the tunnel, at least. And, you know, with that being said, I really can't thank you both uh, for taking the time to be with us today. I know how busy you are, especially with everything that's going on right now. Uh, and this was extremely helpful for all of our listeners. Um, before we say goodbye, I'd like to ask each of you to offer your biggest take-home message for everybody that's listening. And Dr. Lucy, we'll start with you. Any last thoughts? Uh, stay strong, stay safe, and keep hope. I think that next month we're going to hear the results of the Chinese randomized controlled trials for a number of drugs, for immune plasma, uh, for the antibody, the monoclonal to an interleukin-6 receptor, and I hope that you know we have success uh, announced uh, by, by you know with regard to one or more of those of those interventions. And meanwhile, do the social distancing mitigation efforts to flatten the curve. It's in everybody's interest, our patients' interest, our family's interest, our grandparents' interest, and and our own as healthcare providers. Oh, well, well said. And Dr. Anisi, I'll gladly give you the last word. What would you like to convey? I would certainly reinforce uh, mitigation strategies and, and social distancing. I would reemphasize how important um, increasing testing capabilities will be. And I think we should, unfortunately, be prepared for a very overwhelming demand for care, in particular critical care, and that's something we should all be planning for. Um, and I think life is going to be weird for a while, uh, necessarily so, um, uh, but we should expect that. Oh. Well, thank you both again. We hope today's episode was helpful. Please visit www.aaaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.